Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, your toaster needs an audit. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Pete Wright. Today on the show, we're not talking about dead Benjamins, but we are talking about what it means to be a forensic accountant. David Harper is a CPA specializing in litigation support services and financial matters. He's going to help us understand the role of a forensic accountant in the divorce process. David, welcome to The Toaster. Hey, thanks very much, Seth, Pete, for having me. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's an honor, um, you know, for you guys to have an accountant on your show. Uh, really, uh, really does says a lot. I'm sure everyone is just absolutely tuning in and gonna gonna be hanging on every word. As an accountant, you know how important your responsibility is to make numbers entertaining. And that's that's why you're here, because we've watched your videos. We've watched your we've watched your work online. And, and you are, I, I dare say it, you are delightful, David Harper. For an accountant. Uh, it's nice of you to say, Pete. <laughs> For um, an accountant. Uh, what, uh, what accountants really are, are um, actuaries were the personality. So um, in CPA, uh, I don't know if you know what it actually stands for. It stands for can't present to audiences. So, um, you know, the reason we got into this profession is to stay out of having to actually talk to people. And so uh, you're doing but, great. But but somehow we do find ourselves in a in a space, in an environment. And, uh, you know, obviously what I do. Uh, for a living is is exactly that. I'm taking a wealth of complex information, simplifying it so that it tells a story, and then communicating that in a clear uh, and understandable way. Well, let, let's hope you can you can get me through my really rampant financial anxiety. This the whole idea of a forensic accountant and going through uh, uh, finances, divorce, as if a divorce isn't stressful enough. Th- this whole concept of having to to deal with the the numbers gives me. A, a great deal of stress. Can you start by telling us a little bit about what you do as a forensic accountant and why is it forensic? Why are we ta- why did, that's just such a that's a dark word. You know it is a dark word. We're not uh, we're not involved with blood stains or analyzing any, you know dead people, but what we are doing is um we are helping to shed some light on what's going on and essentially what forensic means is following the flows of funds. That's essentially what we're doing. We're just following uh, the flows of funds and making sure uh, that at the end, we have a comprehensive accounting of everything, and we know what the values are of the assets and, uh, um, and the debt. So, so on that, though, there's a lot there. Like, that just sounds like, oh, I just yeah, really the flow of it. the money. Yeah, yeah right. Because yeah. he talks to lawyers all day. So, you know, he doesn't make it idiot proof. He makes it lawyer proof, which is even a bigger standard, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when I hire a forensic accountant, in my cases, what I am asking them to do, Pete, and what David does very well is gather all the information that he needs to do the analysis. Now, check your local jurisdiction, but in Florida family law, people, as we've discussed before on the toaster, are required to produce a bunch of financial information, checking accounts, savings accounts, credit card statements, tax returns, pay stubs. And the reason I mention all of these different items is there isn't one of those items by itself that can tell the story. People say, well, let me look at your income. Just show me your tax return. The tax return might not show all of the income, especially if you own your own business and you're running personal expenses through the business that might be okay from a tax perspective. I'm not saying anyone's doing anything wrong, but in Florida family law, those might not be deemed appropriate business expenses, and they might be deemed personal expenses. And if you run a personal expense through your business, even though it's okay in the federal tax code, it might not be okay in Florida family law, and therefore your income might be higher, okay? Your, your tax return is not going to show how many, wait for it, Pete, vacation days you have saved up. That oh, might be on yeah. your last pay stub of the year. And that the, the value of those vacation days is could be a marital asset that gets divided. 
So that's why you need a forensic account. I know you're waiting to jump on that one, Pete. Nope. No, I don't know what to do with the words that you just said. You are telling me that the value of my unspent time is somehow split? Yes. In a divorce? What? What have you done? If you're working a job and you're banking those hours and you've got a month saved up and your company will pay you out on that <laughs> month, say, don't take it. We'll pay you the cash. That's a marital asset to be divided. Wow. David, tell, t- Pete loves it when you say I'm wrong. I love it when you say I'm right. <laughs> so take your pick there, brother. <laughs> oh, uh, well said. There can very often be a big difference between taxable income on your taxes and available income uh, within family law. So there can be very, uh, there can be a lot of nuances. You know, Seth um, talked about um, in kind benefits, personal expenses being run through. That's that's very often a very large item that requires a lot of scrutiny. Uh, really, just about any business. So we get involved in in that kind of analysis quite a bit. From the perspective of somebody who uh, hasn't gotten divorced and let's just say you know we're listening to the show thinking okay a divorce is in my future can you can you walk through sort of your process when you are when you come into the scene and the kinds of things you're going to do as you as you start working with uh with with one of the spouses who's getting divorced sure so we frame this out in terms of two specific buckets what are the assets and debts so what do you own and what do you owe and then the second bucket being um, income and expenses and we talk about the future sharing of some of those things uh, going forward. Now, we do say they're somewhat like dominoes. So we're normally um, handling the assets and debts prior to uh, looking at income and expenses. So it's normally in that order. But essentially, we are, we're asking them to help prepare a marital balance sheet, which, in, which includes every bank account, every investment account, retirement funds, uh, all the six stones and bones, uh, and then, and then also work on gathering things along with that related to income and expenses uh, and things of that nature. So there's uh, there's mandatory disclosure, which is another f- fancy word. Is you know Seth was talking about there are a certain number of bank statements and and um, and credit card statements and tax returns that are that are required to be to be exchanged up front. Mm-hmm. So we help with that process initially. Who brings you in? Is it usually the 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 attorney who's saying, okay, we're going to need more significant help here or is it is it the the divorcing parties normally it's the attorney um we've worked with over 100 law firms uh, in the tampa bay area Uh, so normally uh we're we are brought in uh the attorney is the the first one involved Uh, there are times obviously people find us through our website but through our relationships with other cpa firms or uh, financial advisors but pete the reason for that i get a case in and I evaluate where I am, where the family is on this case. What kind of assets and debts do they have? And I always do evaluation whether I think I need to get a forensic accountant involved very early in the case, because it's a lot easier to get them involved early and get them going from the start than to bring them in later, where they have to get up to speed or review documents that we've already reviewed, such as the bank accounts and credit card statements and everything we've talked about, or this is, this is David's favorite. Hey, I've got a trial in less than 60 days. Are you available? Like they hate it when lawyers do that. Right. But why would I need a forensic accountant? Yeah. If there is a, um, business that's, um, closely held business, a family business, because now I'm thinking there might be income being run through that business that I'm not going to be able to find as a lawyer. Two, I'm going to need an expert to kind of dig through that. We might need to value the business. So David hasn't mentioned this yet, but he can do a business valuation and say, this is what this business is worth at an, what's called an arm's length transaction. Um, so those would be some reasons. If there is a lot of flowing of income coming in and then expenses going out, and we have to determine whether one of the spouses needs alimony, you have to figure out which ones of those expenses are for the, let's just say the wife who is asking for alimony, what are her expenses versus the children's expenses? So you don't go through the grocery line and say, okay, all of these groceries are for the wife and we're going to ring those up first 
And then these are for the kids and we're going to ring those up. And this is for the husband. We're going to ring those up. You put them all together. So there's some gray area, but the wife's car, car insurance, that's pretty standard. The mortgage, uh, taxes, insurance, what is she spending on her credit card that's identifiable to her? So there's all these things that is quicker, cheaper, and ultimately gives me an expert that if I have to go to court, I can put on the stand to handle all of those. And when we get to this, if there's a forensic accountant on the other side, sometimes they just talk directly and say, yeah, this is what I'm seeing, this is what you're seeing, and maybe we can limit the issues. So sometimes by hiring an expert, people think, oh my God, I'm spending all this money. But ultimately, they save money if they can resolve the issues and get the clients and the lawyers to sign off on those. So you know pretty quickly as an attorney whether or not you're going to need the services of a, of a forensic accountant. Usually in my first initial consultation. Okay. All right. All right. And once I dig in, if I'm in the case for 30, 60 days, I know, but I've been doing it a long time. And I also have a group of forensic accountants uh, in the Tampa Bay area that I am very fortunate to work with that. And sometimes David's, David's been an expert on cases that I have. Sometimes he's been the opposing expert on other cases. So yeah. you never just conflict it out. That's just kind of how it works. But when you have people like David and other people that I work with who are just cream of the crop, it usually ends up getting settled and the forensics usually can narrow the issues. And sometimes it's just an interpretation of the law because the forensic will say, I got this number from the lawyer. And sometimes they'll say, well, here's how I got to this number. And the other one will say, here, I got to this number. And they use these like things called general accounting standards and all this kind of crazy what? stuff, right? You know, just little things like that. Pete. And then we kind of narrow those issues and present them to the court. Okay. So but again, I know you, you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, collaborative cases, and I'd like to know more about what that means. But f- again, from the perspective of somebody who has never done this before, what are the sort of risks and roadblocks that I'm going to need to be looking out for as soon as, David, you start opening up my books? W- what are the, the sort of top issues that I'm going to need to to resolve to help you make your job m- easier? Is that a fair question? Or is it just stay out of the way and l- let me look at your underwear drawer? No, no. In fact, you know, in fact, the more the clients can lean in and be part of the process, it always goes much, uh, much more, uh, much more smoothly. So um, if you're a business owner, uh, you want to be involved, we are going to have conversations where we're looking at these, uh, the, uh, you know, at the books together, um, at adjustments uh, to those books together. And really, ultimately, we're coming up with if there's a if there's a need uh, to value a closely held business, we're obviously going to put a value on that. Yeah, it, it, you know, as one as one of the many assets to be divided on the uh, what's called the uh, the equitable distribution schedule, which ultimately is what uh, what separates out the marital balance sheet. It it sounds like an an audit, just a straight audit, right? It's it, is it the same process? So effectively, um, uh, no, it's not. Uh, in fact, it's different in every case. And okay. Seth mentioned a, a really important point, and that is the work that we can do with other forensic CPAs in the area. We are so incredibly fortunate, especially in this area and in the, in the Tampa Bay area, um, to, to really have a stellar group of, um, of us uh, forensic CPAs. We've known each other for years and years and years. We work extremely well together. And a lot of times we can really streamline um, and shortcut things. So for example, one of us might do the business valuation, the other might do uh, an expense analysis, and then, we, you know, and then we might review each other's work when we're done. And if, we, if we're close enough, normally we can resolve some of those issues outside of court. So here's the, here's the deal though, Pete, because you ask a good question. You're saying it feels like an audit. So I would tell you that hiring a forensic accountant is like having a physical where maybe you get a little blood drawn, maybe you get your temperature taken, but it's not a colonoscopy and audits the colonoscopy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what David's not doing, if you're looking at a business, for example, he's not going through and saying, I want to see the purchase order that came in for this sale that then matches the sale that then matches the payment. Okay. He's just looking at, Hey, this month in sales, we had a hundred thousand dollars. 
he's not digging in to show whether that was real transactions or not, right? Now, he might look yeah, at yeah, a bank yeah. statement to, to match that up, but he's not digging in for an audit to look at every little purchase order, every little, oh, he's not going to go through the petty cash drawer and look for the receipts, right? Sure. That's what a true audit, when people think of an audit is, it's digging into the underlying information, which brings me to the point is all forensic accountants, there are assumptions in everything they do. They're assuming when they see a bank statement that it's an accurate bank statement with the exact amount of money. They're not actually going through and doing an audit of the bank. And uh, the justification behind those numbers. You got it. All right. You got it. Okay. Uh, Let's transition just briefly into collaborative uh, divorce. Can we do that? I know that's important to to both of you, David. It's something you literally jump off cliffs screaming. <laughs> <laughs> can can we talk with about or this? without a parachute? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds like it sounds like it's very exciting, and you might have a problem that needs to be addressed by a professional. Well, I well just ask my wife. I have many yeah. <laughs> many problems that need to be addressed. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm part of a training team along with Kristen Demio, uh, forensic CPA, and uh, and a few others. Um, that uh, that do um, handle these uh, these collaborative trainings. We've trained about 400 people from across the country, uh, 400 professionals of um, uh, lawyers, uh, financial folks, and mental health professionals. And uh, so, as part of those trainings, we like to be a little kitschy. We like to show silly videos uh, that uh, that you know keep things interesting. So, uh, a collaborative practice is essentially it's a way to resolve your disputes without going to court. So uh, it's an alternative dispute resolution process that uh, that allows you, uh, you know, to resolve uh, your disputes based on the interests of the parties as opposed to the positions of the parties. So we can get a lot more into that, but that's uh, that's yeah. the overview. Yeah. So let me just give you an example of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, position is the, the husband says, I want the house, right? That is different than saying the husband says, you know, I have an interest. I would really prefer to keep the house because here comes the interest. It's been my in my family's land for forever. I built the house with my father. It has sentimental value. It's three blocks from the kids' school. It's right around the corner. I think it's best for the kids to stay in this house till they at least graduate high school, right? Those are all the interest, the why he wants to keep the house, okay? As opposed to just saying, I want the house because then you can address those interests, right? And if you're addressing interests, it's a whole lot easier because the wife in my hypothetical could say, I really like the fact that this house is three blocks from school. You know, what I'm struggling with, if you keep the house, there's it's marital, even though it's been in your family's land, you put my name on it. We paid off the whole mortgage. There's all this money tied up in the house. I have an interest in getting half the value of the house. How can I do that? I'm not opposed to you keeping it, but I have another interest as well. I need to get a place for the kids to live as well. And then he says, well, there's a cash account that has the exact half amount of, you know, the exact amount of the value of the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can have all that and I get to keep the house. Well, now we've satisfied everyone's interest because she can say, okay, I'll take that cash account. I'm going to go buy something. And I actually have a little more space to which I can look because maybe I don't have to be three blocks from the school. I can be 10 minutes from the school by car, but we're still pretty close. So that's just a small example of interest versus position, right? And what David does when you're working with that is really get into the underlying aspects of it. When someone says, well, I want the house and here's my interest, David might say, well, there's an account over here that we can look at that as an offset or how about you know retirement, or there might be a way to 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 make that work. So, Dave, yeah, I want David to weigh in. To, to, so, talk talk about how you are are sort of. It sounds like you're trying to see around corners here for on behalf of the people you're working with. Uh, getting to the why, getting to the why, and so the more we can be living in the question. That's a that's a very common phrase uh, that we're that we're using, not just in collaborative cases, but really in you know, most of our most of our cases uh, litigated as well. Uh, you know, live in the question. Um, if I, uh, you know, if I find myself starting every sentence with, well, I think, uh, or I suggest, 
uh, yeah, that's not helpful. Uh, what's helpful is allowing the client to take ownership um, of the situation. Now, you know, often often clients come in and say, you know, they might might say something like, "Look, it, I mean, they're not going to say this, but the implication is it took twenty years for us to create this mess. Now you got next week to figure it out." Uh, well, that's uh, that's not. Uh, uh, you know that's not going to work. So, so uh, asking the why questions um, allows them to take ownership, to think for themselves. Hey, Seth, you know, do you think it would be helpful to? Uh, you know, what options have you thought of? Uh, how do you think your spouse would respond if you uh, presented them with this with this position? So, uh, um, asking good questions and um, you know allowing the the clients to, to take to, uh, take ownership. The other part of that. And I think this is something we, well, I know we haven't talked about it yet today, but we really should. Typically, not always, but typically there is one spouse that's handled the finances. And the other spouse has had other marital duties that have been divided, whether it's taking care of children or some people like, I just make the money and she handles all the books. I have no idea, right? Um, sometimes it's, oh, he's handled everything. I've been raising the kids. I swipe the credit card. I don't know where the money goes. And I am not being, trying to pigeonhole men handle the money and women raise the kids. I've seen all of it. It doesn't matter the gender, but the person who doesn't really know their biggest, I say emotion is fear because it's fear of the unknown, right? So when David's asking the why questions or getting all the information, the more information you have, the less fear there is because now you know how much is in a savings account or a brokerage account. There are people that wake up and they're like, oh my God, we're millionaires? I didn't know that. Wow. And then they get annoyed like, why wasn't I allowed to spend more money? Right? Like, sure, sure, sometimes yeah. there's that other All fear, the like they get well, annoyed for something that's happened. And some people wake up and be like, what do you mean we've got a million dollars worth of debt? Mm-hmm. And David's like, I'm just showing you the numbers. Let's try to figure out a solution now. So we talk about that fear. Well, that, that gets to the next big question of, of like, because we've had, we've had, um, you know, Megan Hunter was on from the High Conflict Institute, right? We, we talk about like what happens when you run into conflict between the parties. Uh, and I have to imagine that as soon as you start turning the pages on the storybook of why your finances ended up in the, the places they are, you're uncovering great opportunities for conflict. How, how do you, in the collaborative process, sort of mitigate, navigate those? Two things come to mind. First of all, we explain to them that there is a process um, and it's sequential. We explain what the process is. The other, the other value really is that... Um, you know, we're having offline conversations as uh, within the professional team. We're making sure that before we go into these meetings uh, with the clients, that we are that we are prepared for. Um, you know, hey, this may be uh, this may be an issue we want to handle delicately. Um, but uh, you know, from the very beginning, what we're explaining to the clients is: that you look, this is this is a process, and this is you know, my role uh, is really is really three things uh, to help gather the information so that the parties can be fully informed. Uh, two, uh, to educate so the parties can be on equal footing from a knowledge-based uh, standpoint, uh, you know, capable of making informed decisions. Uh, and three, facilitate conversations uh, around uh, you know, creative approaches to uh, problem solving. So, so you them uh, realizing um, at the forefront that, hey, this is a process and this collaborative team has done this plenty of times before um, I'm in good hands. And to pivot on that, Pete, the friends accountant basically does the exact same thing. If they're in a litigation mode working with the lawyer, they're just doing it on their side of the transaction. Because I'm going to ask David, gather the information. Let's say, make sure we have it where the lawyer understands it and the client understands it. And now let's kind of come up with some creative solutions to resolve the matter if we can settle it. And if not, then it turns into the lawyer working with David or any forensic accountant on how they present the information. Because David presents schedules. There's no requirement on how those schedules look for the court. That's up to the expert and the lawyer. So when you have a really good forensic, 
and a really good lawyer, you can take vast amounts of information and boil it down into a slide or two or three that becomes a persuasive document for the court to make its decision. Now, I'm not saying you're doing anything sketchy in these things. The other side has all the backup information. You have all the backup information. But just how a graph, right? Do you do it by a pie chart? Do you do it by a line graph? How do those look differently? Um, Do you do it by the thousand or the 10,000 or the million? Like, how does that impact the presentation to the ultimate decision maker who you're trying to persuade the judge in our cases? But up until that point, it's the same, I would say. It's just kind of packaged a little differently. That's exactly right. That's ex- that's uh, it's the same type of process, uh, really, regardless of if, if this were a collaborative case or if this is litigated. Uh, the other thing that we can get into uh, in a few minutes is uh, the role of the joint um, expert. So there doesn't have to be um, a forensic CPA on each side. There can be so one. So you have somebody who's working both sides at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. That seems dangerous, emotionally dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> for the forensic? Or is that yeah. what you're worried about? You're worried about data <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm data. worried about the forensic. Well, that's right. These these cases, uh, you know, have their own unique set of challenges, especially for the for the joint, uh, you know, for the expert that's really trying to toe that line. Uh, but I'll tell you really uh, where a lot of this comes from. Um, I'm going to use the D word, uh, discovery, which means uh, document gathering. So um, in all of our trainings, we always say, uh, keep your hands raised if discovery just the just the exchange of information can consume 40% of the total time. Uh, keep your hands raised if it's over 50%, okay, over 60%. And still a lot of these people, you know, a lot of these professionals still have their hands raised. 60% of, of the time spent is just on exchanging information. And you know what, Seth? Thanks for providing three years worth of your Amex statements. But guess what? There were two missing months from 2018 that we still don't have. And what are you trying to hide by not providing me those? So Cash yeah. withdrawals for strippers and blow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well, that's exactly, that was exactly getting my next question, which is, you know, you talk about how you're sort of taking the data and massaging it into a format that makes a persuasive argument. How often do you run into these cases where people bring to you incomplete information or somehow manipulated financial data that somehow they think they're trying to serve their case. What do you do in those cases? Uh, well, uh, you know, two distinct things. One is incomplete information. The other is, you know, you really are trying to, trying to screw yeah. somebody. But, um, uh, you know, what I say a lot is really we're trying to be streamlined, but complete. So the the entire time it's being efficient as possible, but as exhaustive as we need to be. So so we are asking those questions to the degree we we need to. Now, uh, there have been some cases where the husband has said, "Hey, look, um, you know, I've got this paramour. I've been, you know, I bought her a house. Uh, I bought her, a, you know, whatever the situation may be, um, and the total of that, uh, you know, is X. You know, sometimes we can have an agreement that that okay, there was this much waste." Um, but, you know, an affidavit is uh, you know assigned to that effect, basically putting that value back on the marital balance sheet on his on his side or her side, um, where we don't have to go d- digging through years worth of uh, bank statements to come to the, you know, to arrive at a similar conclusion. And, and on that point, Pete, every client is entitled to go through this exchange of information called discovery and look under every rock. The question comes in every case is what is the potential return on investment for looking under every rock. And when it's going to cost attorney's fees and accountant fees to keep digging and digging and digging, is it potentially worth that time? A lot of time, the answer to that is no. So you end up just sort of cutting bait, right? You cut bait. But what happens is you might say to David, David, You've been doing this a long time. You're an expert at this. I know you don't have all the information. What's your gut feel on this? Seth, I think I'm pretty good. There's some holes here that I think should be filled, but I've been doing this a long time. And I think that, you know, maybe we're missing 15% or maybe this account. It just doesn't make sense that there's a lot of money running through here the way the other transactions were happening. Like you can kind of make um, very well thought out 
reasonable assumptions and inferences to then say, we've got enough information, let's move forward. Now, sometimes if the other side's not giving the information, I can pull this very, very complicated legal strategy and file what's called a motion for negative inference, which basically says to the judge, judge, we had a count with $100,000 in it, and we've asked him for follow-up statements. We've asked him for all the documents. We've subpoenaed the bank. He's, you know, they said the money got moved to another one and it was withdrawn or it was withdrawn. We've asked for him to follow up where the cash withdrawal went. He hasn't given us anything. Therefore, we're asking the court to take a negative inference and say that he wasted the hundred grand because he's just not telling you where it is and he's not giving us the information. And the judge can say, sir, if you're not giving the info, I've got nothing left to do. I'm going to tag you with that hundred grand of marital waste. You owe her 50 G's. So either give her 50 G's or give her the information so she can do the analysis and you can argue, but judge, I spent it on the mortgage. I spent on the kid's high school education. I spent it on child support, but without giving the information, sir, I'm sorry. We have rules here. So that's another tactic that you can use in court. Can I, uh, uh, can I pivot? Do I have your permission to pivot? We have a listener question that I think is appropriate for this uh, esteemed panel. Oh, esteemed panel. Esteemed, it's a very yeah. easy question. Right. What do you, what do you think about that? Uh, and, and I think you've already started talking about it. And I, you know, normally we, we might take this uh, in another direction, but I, I, I think this is important. This is from uh, listener uh, Sarah Peters, who says the following. My husband informed me that he wants a divorce. We agree it's time, but there are sensitive points. I've brought up a housing agreement a dozen times, but it just leads to fighting. He wants to keep it, I guess, but doesn't want to pay me out. Meeting an attorney next week and would love advice on questions I should be asking so I don't miss anything and can make a good case for him and stop fighting. I feel like we're in a storm right now and not clearly seeing the facts. Thanks. Now, I bring that up because I think it deals with a lot of uh, a lot of issues that that you know you've talked about in your experience and also the emotional sort of storm that just happens when you're in this process, right? How do you how would you give guidance to Sarah uh for for helping to navigate these waters? David? Sure, sure. And I'll just just mention very quickly that the two Two can can you know of course are somewhat interrelated. I mean you've got uh, you've got spouses that are just suddenly blindsided by this news. So so part of the objective from the financial standpoint is to you help them make a shift from their right brain scattered um, sensitive and emotional thoughts and and help them um, organize through some left brain exercises to to some degree. So because we really can't analyze the house in a vacuum. We need to know, um, are there other substantial accounts? Are there investment accounts? Are there cash accounts? Other, um, are there other assets out there that might go back to what Seth was saying earlier to, uh, to offset the value of the house if the husband did want to stay? Would there be enough value elsewhere where the wife would be walking away with something similar? Um, so from a financial standpoint, we're, you know, it's hard to make a decision on the house until we have information regarding other assets. Okay. So this really gets to the stop the fighting part. Yeah, it's the emotional part as well. But I think the question itself raises some questions. So she says he wants to keep the house, I guess. So there's not a clear answer on that. Right, right. So, and he doesn't want to pay me out. So if he is not answering after the direct question, sitting here today, do you want to keep the house? The answer might be, I don't know, because I don't know how everything else is going to flush out. I.e., do I want to be house poor? Right? Do I want to have all my assets in this house that I have to pay this mortgage on and I don't really have a lot of disposable income afterwards? Well, that kind of depends on how all the other dominoes falls, as David says. He doesn't want to pay me out. Okay, well, that's going to be a problem if you're entitled to half the value. But here's the thing, would love the advice on questions I should be asking so I don't miss anything. You should ask your lawyer, what information do you need from me so you can help me solve this problem? This is all about problem solving. And if I can't get the information or don't know where it is, what is the process? 
Okay. The thing that I would give a cautionary tale to the remaining aspects of this is so I can make a good case for him and stop fighting. You can't make someone stop fighting, right? So I think though you're trying to reach a settlement and you're trying to get a quote good case for him, most spouses will stop listening to you when you say the following words. Well, my lawyer says. (laughs) Okay. Okay. All right. So she's kind of asking, hey, what do I tell my, what can I get from my lawyer so I can tell my husband, this is what my lawyer is saying, so stop fighting. So that's probably an unrealistic solution. However, there's a realistic solution. You get the information. You ask all those questions to your lawyer. What do I need to get to you? What happens if I can't get it to you? After I get you in the information, what's the next step? And the lawyer might say, well, then we double check the values. We determine who's going to get what asset. And we're going to put it in a format that we give him the house because that's what we think he wants. And then we're going to divide up all the other assets. And if it's okay with you, we're going to send it over to him as an offer. And then hopefully we get a response either from him or his lawyer that says, well, no, I don't want the house. Let's just sell it. Okay. Or "Mm, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Or then it will raise other questions. So I don't want them to think, hey, I'm in a storm right now. If I just get this and I get an offer over, it's going to solve. Here's what's coming next. Well, doesn't it doesn't it also seem like it, it's indicative of what I have to imagine is incredibly natural in the divorce process, which is having this one big thing representative of the entire divorce, right? Like the house is this giant asset and it's full of memories and uh, emotion. And if we can just solve this, then everything else is probably going to be easy. Right. That I just feel like that's that that's kind of the that's what I'm reading. That's subtextually what I'm getting out of this question. Right. And and that was going to be the next step is don't think if you solve this problem, everything else is going to be easy because they're all intertwined. Yeah. Right. 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 And so the next step might be. We agree on all this, but there's not enough other assets to offset the house. Okay, well, can he get a mortgage? Can he get a home equity line of credit? Does he have to take you off of the mortgage? How does all of that work? And you got to do your due diligence starting early to see if you can get a final resolution on that. David, any additional thoughts? Do you want to, if you have this opportunity to call Seth wrong in any way, shape, or form? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I hate it, but I can't. I can't call him wrong on this. Uh, I okay. agree uh, with uh, with what uh, with what Seth is saying. You know, often, uh, you know, the other the other side of this. You know, we're talking about the two buckets: the assets and debts being one bucket, and then the income and expenses being another bucket. And sometimes, part of the support discussion can fit in here. That that hey, there might not be quite enough assets to to offset. Uh, the value of a house, but uh, but perhaps we can talk about child support, or we can talk about alimony as part of a part of a global uh, resolution. Yeah. Well, this has been. Uh, uh, excuse uh, me, Pete. I'm not yeah. letting that slide. Are what? you kidding what? me? All right. Yeah. All right. Hello, take your, Toaster take your Bingo. Turn. Seth was right again. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was just going to let that go? I, uh, I okay. You've got another another notch on the wall, Seth. Um, I I do have a uh, one final question. Speaking of toaster bingo, I don't have the bell out, but uh, what sort of jurisdictional uh, concerns or constraints do you have, David? I mean, can you do you work across state lines, or uh, are you just in the Tampa, Florida area? Great question. So I am a CPA in in uh, the state of Georgia um, as well as Florida, uh, but uh, but our litigation support uh, practices devoted to the state of Florida because every every state obviously follows different legislative nuances, case law, and so forth. So, But I will tell you, he's a very smart guy. He got his master's degree in accounting from University of Virginia, which 
is much more impressive than being Sumer Kamade from Auburn. <laughs> roll Tide, roll Tide, David, and that's coming from my son and his bonus dad, Steve. Oh no! Uh, did I just hear a roll, <laughs> roll Tide. tide. That, that, yes, that you did. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! <laughs> I have to do a war eagle back at it. Speaking <laughs> speaking of mic drops, uh, uh, David, where, if we're our Florida listeners, where do you want them to go to learn a little bit more about you, your work, your training? What? Uh, give us a plug. Sure, uh, WestBayCPAs.com. WestBayCPAs.com is our uh, website a lot of information on there a lot of articles good content uh we really got a great team i feel very very blessed that we uh, we do have a great team of uh, cpas and uh, staff members so uh, great to be with you today outstanding thanks for your time and uh, thank you everybody for downloading and listening to the show uh you know we talked about sarah peter's question which was wonderful if you want to ask your own question head over to nelsoncoster.com slash ask a question and uh, there's a form there you can be completely anonymous uh, uh drop us a line let us know uh, what's on your mind and we'll get seth and our fantastic guests uh to weigh in uh on the show on behalf of of, uh, you know, the, the fantastic David Harper, who makes numbers fun, uh, and America's favorite divorce attorney, Seth Nelson. I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, the divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.